Hello, my name is Lee Stoner. I direct the Cardiometabolic Lab at UNC and today I'm going to talk about pulse wave velocity. Before we get going, on this slide you will find some acronyms that will be used throughout this presentation. Please take just a moment to familiarise yourself with these. During this presentation, we will first question what is pulse wave velocity. We will then have a brief look at the devices available to take this measurement. And we will finish by discussing the importance of pulse wave velocity. So let's start here by questioning what is pulse wave velocity. What is pulse wave velocity? Well, simply put, it is the speed of the forward pressure wave between two sites. This speed is dependent on both the structure and function of the artery or arteries in question, and we'll come back to this. Uh, of note, the structure of a, a given artery is different throughout the vascular tree and we'll also come back to this. The most commonly measured site for pulse wave velocity is the aorta which we can measure by looking at the speed of the pulse wave between the carotid and femoral arteries. This slide presents a simple diagram demonstrating what we mean by carotid to femoral pulse wave velocity. I said on the previous side that it is the speed with which a pulse travels between two sites of interest. The way that we calculate it is by measuring the distance between those two sites and then by dividing by the pulse transit time. To measure the pulse transit time, we can use different techniques. For example, a tonometer, which is a, a pressure transducer. We will come back to this shortly. And if we use this technique to simultaneously measure the pulses at two different sites, they will look something like this image here. Of course, the upstroke of the carotid pulse is going to begin before the upstroke of the femoral pulse because it takes some time for that pulse to travel between point A and point B. The way that we calculate the pulse transit time is by looking at the time between the foot of the carotid wave and the foot of the femoral wave. This is a really neat slide depicting the progression of atherosclerosis, um, the common process uh, leading to cardiovascular disease. And this slide is neat because it nicely illustrates the importance of measuring arterial stiffness, which here is framed as vascular stiffness. Now, if we look at early on in the atherosclerosis process, we will first see change in the function of a vessel. The function is dependent on how well the endothelial cells of the vessel work. So we typically refer to that as endothelial function. And then following dysfunction of these endothelial cells, 
there will start to be some structural changes to the vessel which will result in increased arterial stiffness. If we look here though, the important um, point to take home is that this ar arterial stiffening process occurs early in the process. And this is why pulse wave velocity is a particularly useful measure because it's subclinical. We can detect change in cardiovascular risk before overt symptomology occurs. And then subsequent to the arterial stiffening, we'll start to get more drastic morphological changes, including an increase in intermedia thickness and then the building up of plaque followed by um, the advent of calcification. Now, something important to remember when we use any method is the old saying, crap in, crap out. And by this, I mean, we have to be confident in the measurements that we are making. We have two constructs of importance, uh, which include precision, which is synonymous with reliability and accuracy, which we also refer to as fluidity. Both are important, um, but for different reasons. Precision means that we are getting the same numbers or similar numbers for, uh, on repeat assessments. If the device is not precise enough, we're not going to be able to detect the desired change in, in this instance, arterial stiffness over time. Now, we need to keep in mind though, that a device can be precise, but not accurate as, de as is depicted in the right corner there, meaning that the device is not actually telling us what we think it is. Accuracy refers to just that, is the device actually telling us what we think it is? Optimally, we want a device that is both precise and accurate. The great thing about the device that we are using in Pulse, the Excel device, is that it is highly reliable. Within day intraclass correlation coefficients of up to 0.99, have been reported and between day coefficients of 0 0.98. Now this is going to be part of the training because we need to be able to demonstrate this in each laboratory. An additional cool aspect is that we can have confidence in the uh, pulse wave velocity measurements. Pulse wave velocity is very strongly associated with cardiovascular disease risk. One meta-analysis reported that for each one meter a second increase in pulse wave velocity, the risk of cardiovascular events increases by 14% and the risks of cardiovascular mortality increases by 15%. Also of great value is that international reference norms are available. That is, we know what a pulse wave velocity should be for a given age of an individual. Now, we should remember though that a measurement is only accurate if performed under the conditions for which it has been validated. For the Pulse study, we will be standardizing conditions. And an additional consideration is that the major source of error for this measurement is path length. So I said that we need to be able to measure the distance between the two sites of interest. Now, as you can imagine, 
these measurements can be challenging in pregnant women as the size of the stomach grows um, if we measure across the the top of the woman of course we're going to have um, a greater distance between sites however the aorta is not following the size of that stomach so we need a way to directly measure between the sites um, while avoiding body contours now fortunately this will not be such a large issue for the current study because we will be measuring women in the first and second trimesters nonetheless we are going to minimize um, this potential source of error and we will come back to the approach that we will use later on in this presentation Let us now take a closer look at the devices available to measure pulse wave velocity. A number of technologies are available to measure pulse wave velocity, including ultrasound, tonometry, oscillometry, and a combination of tonometry and oscillometry. There are other devices, but these are the most common ones. The tonometry method uses a highly sensitive pressure transducer and this transducer or tonometer is used to apply force over the center of a superficial artery against an underlying bone. On this slide, we see examples of two tonometric devices. On the left, we see the sphygma core. With this device, the tonometer, the pencil-like object sticking up from the white box will be used to record a signal at the carotid and then perhaps at the femoral. These recordings are taken at different times so they are gated using ECG. To the right we see the complier where you see the tonometer being held in place by a neck brace. The um, tonometer will be held in place by similar braces on other parts of the body. Measurements can also be made using oscillometry or sensitive blood pressure cuffs. This is an example of the Vicorder device. A cuff is placed around the neck and the femoral artery. Note that these cuffs go up to a light pressure, so when they do inflate, it's not very noticeable. The cuffs go up simultaneously and record the pressure signals simultaneously so that no gating is needed via ECG. Here is a depiction of the Sphygma Core Excel device 
you will see that a combination of tonometry and oscillometry is being used. So we see the tonometer being placed uh, on the carotid artery and the cuff, the oscillometric device, uh, around the femoral artery. Measurements can also be made using ultrasound. In this example, we measured leg pulse wave velocity. A recording was taken at the superficial femoral artery and then the posterior tibial artery. We can also make measurements using photoplevismography. With this device, an infrared light is um, shined in the skin and the, um, the speed at which the red blood cells travel through the capillaries under the skin are detected. Okay, so I have talked a little bit about what pulse wave velocity is. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the importance of this measure. So that hopefully you can have confidence in this measurement when you are performing it on the patient population. So in the next few slides, I am going to give an overview of arterial stiffness. We will then dig a bit deeper into the basic anatomy of the vascular system and then finish by talking a little bit more about the clinical importance of this measurement. As I mentioned before, arterial stiffness is dependent on the function of the vessel, which in turn is dependent on endothelial function. And this can change um, within and between days. But what we normally believe we are um, reflecting through arterial stiffness is the structure of the vessel which is dependent on the vessel wall extracellular matrix, which is depicted by the um, figure to the right, which popped up. And we will discuss a bit more in the next couple of slides. If we take a closer look at the anatomy of a given vessel, the innermost layer is called the intima. And this is where we find those endothelial cells, the cells maintaining the function of the vessel and the cells which are coming into contact with the blood. The middle layer, the medial, is where we find the smooth muscle cells. These are the cells which contract and relax to maintain vascular tone. And then the outermost layer the adventitial layer or externa is where we find that extracellular matrix. Um, so this is composed of connective tissue and it's important because it maintains the shape of the vessel. And this is where we will find the nerves innervating a vessel. Of importance to the concept of arterial stiffness and the importance of arterial stiffness to the functioning of the cardiovascular system is that the three layers I just mentioned are present in all parts of the vascular tree in both the arteries and the veins. That is um, until of course we get down to the um, capillaries where we do not find all these layers.
those different layers that we saw on the previous slide are important to the concept of arterial stiffness um, and of particular importance to our interest in the stiffness of the aorta. So of course the aorta is the big tube that is arising from the left ventricle of the heart. We first have the ascending aorta, then there's a, an arch followed by the descending aorta, which is now going to travel down towards the femoral artery. So the question you're asking is, well, why are those layers we just looked at important to the aorta? Well, they help to define how the aorta functions. The aorta has quite thin walls relative to the diameter of the vessel. Now, those walls do contain well-defined connective tissue, but that connective tissue contains many elastic fibers. What this means is the aorta is a highly elastic vessel and acts as a pressure reservoir. So when that blood is pumped out of the left ventricle, the aorta stretches, that energy is stored and when that energy is released, i.e. when the vessel recoils, the vessel helps the heart do its work in pumping the blood down towards the systemic circulation. This is an even cooler concept. So that aorta we said is highly elastic, meaning it has a low amount of stiffness, which is great because it helps with that recoil function and propelling blood forward. Um, it's also presents the largest opposition to the work of the heart. So the more elastic that vessel, the less hard the heart has to work. If we now look down through the vascular tree, we will see that the vessels um, gradually stiffen. They get stiffer and stiffer as they go down towards the extremities. So, as we just said, the vessels gradually stiffen as we travel from the ascending aorta down towards the periphery. This is important because it helps to ensure consistent blood flow, including during diastole. So the blood will not flow so freely if we don't have this gradient during diastole. And this gradient attenuates the forward traveling pressure wave, preventing the pressure wave from hitting target end organs so hard and will help to moderate the reflection of pressure waves back towards the heart. This slide shows a diagram from a review my colleagues and I wrote and nicely depicts some of the information presented on the previous slide. So if we look at the, the heart, that big lump in, in the middle, and you see the aorta coming off of the heart, you will see there's a forward traveling pressure wave, which is labeled pulse wave velocity. So again, that tube coming off of the heart is highly elastic, and then the vessels stiffen as um, we move towards the periphery. Without that gradient, those backward waves, which is, we see as arterial wave reflection there, will travel back towards the heart more readily and mean the heart has to work harder to pump a given amount of blood around the body. This will subsequently result in left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, also, if that forward um, traveling pressure wave is not dampened, 
it will hit those end organs uh, more um, readily than uh, otherwise and these end organs include the kidney and as we see here the brain let's finish this section of the video by putting our new knowledge into the context of clinical importance and there are a few points I want to emphasize um, as we just saw the um, stiffness of the aorta and the gradient is important um, because it helps with normal vascular function but it also um, reflects how advanced one may be in the disease um, process uh, we can use this measure to predict, predict cardiovascular disease risk and it's really cool that we have normative data available so coming back to this slide that we looked at earlier on I just want to re-emphasize the point that this stiffening process happens early on it is a subclinical marker meaning we can measure one's risk for cardiovascular disease early in the process and hopefully we can discover ways to offset future risk again as I mentioned earlier on we know that pulse wave velocity predicts cardiovascular events in a range of patients it is highly associated with cardiovascular disease carotid femoral pulse wave velocity is the gold standard measurement of arterial stiffness and we know that a one meter a second increase in pulse wave velocity is associated with a 15 percent increased risk of cardiovascular disease of great use to us is the fact that a lot of normative data is available as I'll show you in a moment some of this normative data is presented on the Excel device itself we have a lot of data out there in general about how arterial stiffness pro progresses in both adults and children and VASC AgeNet, which is part of the Artery Society, is currently doing some great work gathering all the data available for pulse wave velocity so that we can come out with either, even clearer normative data. Now, we should mention though that normative data is not available for pregnant women. Um, so hopefully we'll be making a useful addition to the literature via this study. My colleagues and I conducted a review of longitudinal epidemiological studies so we could um, consolidate the literature looking at how much the pulse wave velocity increases with each passing year we found that every, for every five years pulse wave velocity increases between 0.2 to 0.7 meters per second additionally we have also consolidated the studies looking at change in pulse wave velocity with age in children we found that in children for each year pulse wave velocity increases by 0.12 meters per second so after watching this presentation hopefully you know a little bit about what pulse wave velocity is the different ways we can measure it and why it is important thank you for listening